Our scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, starting in the 19th verse, and I'm reading from the uh, Common English Bible. I think that's what is actually on the screen as well. It looks like it. So we'll see if we're on the same page. It was still the first day of the week, that evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And when the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the other disciples when Jesus came, and the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, His disciples were again in a house, and Thomas was with them. And even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, My Lord and my God. And Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. And then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll, but these things are written, so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing, you will have life in his name. The Word of God. It's good to be with you today. In my many years of ministry, I always tried to pawn off the Sunday after Easter to my associate minister. So I don't know if I should thank Meredith and Jerry for inviting me today or give them some grief about it. They could have done that. But either way, I'm happy to be with you. Six years ago, when I finished up my 15 years of ministry at First Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana, and retired, I took several weeks of specialized training to do interim ministry. And despite the disruption of COVID, I've been privileged to come alongside three different congregations over the last five years, as they have lived through a transition time. Uh, In all three, it was the retirement of their pastor after many years. And one lesson that I learned in those transitional ministries is that every ministry and minister is temporary. And every congregation is going through change, whether they want to or not. That's part of why I've been co-teaching a class for interim ministers, for disciple interim ministers, introducing some of the concepts of interim ministry, intentional interim ministry, where we try to actually work with the congregation to help them understand where they're heading next and where God is calling them. And at the heart of that interim ministry is a process of openness to change, a process of openness to creativity, and to really wrestle with where God wants a congregation to be next. And I know that with Amanda and your other leaders, that is what you're doing here, that you're on a journey to where God is going to lead you in the months and years ahead. It is a very exciting but also rather scary time to be church. Well, we are one week past Easter, and everything changes at Easter. 
Before Easter, Jesus is the measure of everything the disciples know and understand. He is there to help them understand the ways of the world, to make sense of the world around them. But after Easter, they become witnesses. They carry the story. They are the ones who will bring Jesus to life in the imaginations and the hearts of those that they meet. And so their very first opportunity to bear witness is with a good friend, a member of their small band of followers, Thomas. With great excitement, they talk about how the women saw Jesus at, you know, just outside the tomb and then how they themselves saw Jesus risen from the dead, Jesus come back to life, Jesus who has done what he said he would do. It's a really big deal. And they fail. Thomas won't. Thomas can't believe his friends. Unless I see the marks and touch him, I cannot believe. I really wonder if maybe we should change this story title and stop calling it the story of doubting Thomas and maybe call it instead the story of the ineffective apostles. They can't even convince one of their own. Richard Rohr is a Franciscan teacher and writer who's a very significant voice in the church over the past few decades, and he wrote a blog post for Easter, I think about five years ago or so, but it keeps speaking to me. And he starts out in his blog post, he, it's, he calls it the death of death. And he writes, the seeds of Easter are already found in Christmas. If God can become flesh incarnating in the material world, then resurrection is a natural conclusion. Nothing divine can die. Easter isn't celebrating a one-time miracle as if that only happened in the body of Jesus and we're all here to cheer for Jesus. That's really not the point. But it is the message, he writes, that most Western Christians have been told when Christianity split into East and West way back in 1054, both sides lost a piece of the puzzle. And he continues talking about artwork, and he quotes John Dominic Crossan, another theologian, who had studied images of the resurrection and found that Western art, you know, the art that we're used to, the art that we even see around the sanctuary a little bit, you know, that Western art that we're used to always depicts Jesus, or most often does, walking out of the tomb alone with a white flag. Here comes Jesus out of the tomb, saying, look at me, I made it. And our theological declaration is, Jesus rose from the dead. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. The Eastern Church, our Greek and Russian Orthodox and other Eastern Church folks, have always seen the resurrection in three different ways. The trampling of hell, the corporate leading out of hell, and the corporate uplifting of humanity with Christ. John Dominic Crossan notes that the Eastern icons of the resurrection, which are sometimes called the harrowing of hell, Jesus is surrounded by many people as he stands astride of hell and there's chains and bolts and locks flying in all directions. And in many interpretations, Hades, the god of death, not to be confused with Satan, a very different one, is bound at the bottom of the pit while Jesus pulls Adam and Eve, symbols of all humanity, out of the pit. This is a very different message than what we received in Western Christianity, either Catholic or Protestant. Eastern imagery has a hopeful message that is not only about Jesus, but about society and humanity and history itself. And Rohr reports all that and then concludes this way. He says, brothers and sisters, if we don't believe that every crucifixion, war, poverty, torture, hunger, can somehow be redeemed, who among us would not be angry or cynical or hopeless? No wonder Western culture seems so skeptical today 
It all doesn't mean anything. It's not going anywhere. Because we weren't given a wider and cosmic vision of Jesus' resurrection. Easter is not just the final chapter of Jesus' life, but the final chapter of history. Death does not have the last word. Unless I see the marks of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Who do we listen to? Where do we get the stories and information about faith? What do you and I need to have faith, to trust God? Who bears witness for us? You know, every once in a while, about once a year, there's a movie released that has a faith theme. You remember Heaven is for Real and God's Not Dead and then God's Not Dead too, and Young Messiah and the Passion and Miracles from Heaven. A few years ago, one came out called Breakthrough. It was about a young boy who fell through the ice, and when he's finally pulled from the icy water and rushed to the hospital, he's presumed dead by everyone except his mother, who is convinced that if she will pray for a miracle, he will be healed. And sure enough, she does, and he is restored. And these movies that kind of float around us join a centuries-long practice of seeking out and reporting on miracles as evidence of God's presence and power. To be canonized as a saint in the Catholic Church, investigators have to find evidence of three miracles that you performed. It's kind of the ritual they go through. They go digging around in history, and they try to find the miracles that someone has done. When Mother Teresa underwent that scrutiny, when her life underwent that scrutiny, they found three miracles, and they promptly, you know, certified her as a saint. But I wonder what she would have thought of that, because her life was not about miracles or being saintly because of miracles. Her life was around the ministry she performed with the least of these, her brothers and sisters, those who were poor in her native area. Which was really more important, the miracles they say she performed or her ministry over many years? Which do we see? Who is it that speaks to us? Where do we gain understanding of faith? I did a Bible study a while back, and we started out with a quote that made us all kind of nod in understanding. The quote was, and I'm not sure where it came from. I think it was just in the Bible study book. The more you grow in your faith and the more profoundly you know God, the more you know that you do not know. The more you grow in your faith and the more that you know God, the more you know that you do not know. Who do we hear? Who do we allow to bear witness to us? Whose stories of encounter with the holy, with the sacred, carry weight for us? A few years ago, just before COVID shut everything down, I attended the Festival of Faiths downtown. Has anybody attended the Festival of Faiths? Yeah, I got a couple hands here and there. Uh, that year, one of the speakers slash entertainers was a young African-American gay Messianic Jew from Brooklyn who sang the songs of slavery mixed in with some Duke Ellington and Aretha Franklin, and he bore witness to the Spirit. And he did that in the presence of about 500 or so of us middle class, largely retired urban professionals. And he was received with acclamation and joy. He and I have so little in common. He's young, urban, hip, black, progressive. I'm old, Middle Western, small town, staid, white, straight. We have very little on the surface that would bring us together. And yet he not only entertained me, He bore witness to me and the hundreds of others. He showed me Jesus. Unless I see the marks of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Richard Rohr invites me to see the witness of the Eastern Church at Easter. 
a Messianic Jew singing the songs of slavery, speaks to me, the saints of the church. Who is it that we listen to? Who is it that tells us the stories? Now, I grew up in a church, much like many of the churches we grew up in, where the Sunday school stories were very carefully curated. Now, I didn't know that at the time, but I learned it afterwards. They worked very hard to avoid the hard stuff. You know what I mean. We learned about David and Goliath, the little shepherd boy overcoming the big bad bully. But they never told us about David and Uriah, the powerful king bumping off a rival to cover up an affair. We learned about Jonah and his encounter with a big fish, but we really didn't dig more deeply into the implications of what Jonah was asked to do when he went to Nineveh and the justice and mercy that that story really represented. I'd sit in the pews, you know, during the, on Sunday morning, and these old white-haired guys, yep, that's them, uh, at least to my 10-year-old perception, you know, would be there preaching, and occasionally we'd have a guest preacher roll in, you know, maybe a Methodist or a Lutheran. We might tolerate a Baptist in a pinch, but never a Catholic priest or a Jewish rabbi. And I don't think back then in the 60s that I even knew what a Hindu or a Buddhist was. My world was very small, these carefully curated stories, a very protected pulpit in the church. By high school and college, a few other voices began to break in. I learned about charismatics and Pentecostals and the budding evangelical movement, the Jesus movement. We would all wear our buttons and our long hair and go out and sing. I took philosophy of religion in college. Wow, did that change things. And then systematic theology and process theology and liberation theology and feminist theology and ethics and lots of biblical studies in seminary. And then I walked out into the church to serve as a pastor where I began to meet real people, living lives that collided with the narrative of faith that I had learned at church camp years ago. Because each of us brings our own unique stories to this place, to this faith journey on this Sunday after Easter. We are each witnesses. At that festival of faiths, we listened to a Buddhist monk conversing with a brain scientist about how to see the world. We listened to an indigenous teacher known by both her Native American name, Woman Stands Shining, but also as Pat, as she sat and talked with a psychiatrist. And we were filled. We heard witness. Unless I see the marks of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Who gets to speak? To whom do we listen? Who will move us closer to faith or maybe just a little further from doubt? Bob Boyd is the president of the Fetzer Institute, a philanthropic organization focused on compassion. And he spoke as part of the closing panel at that Festival of Faiths. And he stated the obvious first. He said that we were pretty much all similar people sitting there in the auditorium. Liberal, like-minded people. Sure, some were Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, a host of other faiths, maybe some of no faith. But in general, we were pretty similar, pretty much aligned politically and in our assessment of how faith might impact the world. And he asked us, his challenge to us was, he said, where are the other voices? Where is the T.D. Jakes, the Joel Olstein, the Franklin Grahams, the Mike Pence, a spiritual leader of ISIS, an Hasidic Jew, a creation science believer. Can they speak to us as well? Can they challenge us as well? Unless I see the marks of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Foyt's words are ever more meaningful today because we're awash in this sort of quasi-religious and political information and disinformation and opinion 
Just look at Facebook, if you dare, and see how people are talking about the eclipse tomorrow and all the wild theories about what it might mean. We have to figure out who it is that we will listen to and how we will listen. You might remember Madeline Lingle, the wonderful writer. In her book, Penguins and Golden Calves, she tells a story about a family who has a a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter and expects another baby. And when the baby arrives, they do what parents do. They try to make sure the two-and-a-half-year-old can really relate to this new baby. And they try to soften the displacement she might feel, encouraging her to hold and help change the baby. And everything is fine until one night they're trying to put their daughter to bed. And she says rather frantically, I want to see baby. Well, of course, darling, we'll take you to see the baby. No, alone. No, mommy and daddy will go with you. No, I want to see baby alone. She's distraught. And finally, they let her go, but they do stay close. And she bends over the cradle and says, tell me about God. I'm forgetting. Unless I see the marks of the nails and put my hands in his side, I will not believe. I think we all want that childlike certainty, that moment of revelation, the aha, where we just get it, that mountaintop experience that reveals the secrets of the universe to us. But more often, all we get is each other, a guitar player playing up front, singing a song, a preacher standing, an offering plate being passed. That's what we get. Others around us who might bear a word, an image, a challenge, to guide us and to confront us. We, too, forget. Madeline Langle said in an interview with The Other Side magazine way back in the mid-90s that she had had a good education and she kind of was very scientific and wanted everything explained, but as she got older, she began to recognize it was easier to believe in and accept the impossible. She said to the interviewer, she was finally able to accept the idea that God actually loved her. It was a revelation for her. And she said she stopped wanting certainty, which would never come, but rather just lived in the moment of knowing that she was loved. Unless I see the marks of the nails... And put my hand in his side, I will not believe. And that's the rub on this Sunday after Easter. Despite all the hoopla and pageantry last week and that journey through Lent leading up to Easter, we still don't get to put our hands on his or touch him. We do not get to investigate his wounds. Instead, we're just given each other. That's what we get. It's our gift to bear and to receive witness. Go and tell the story. Go and tell your story. Go and live your lives. Go and be witnesses. Amen.